This is History Talk, produced by Origins, Current Events, and Historical Perspective at Ohio State and Miami Universities. I'm Patrick Pajandi. And I'm Mark Sikulski. Perhaps more than any other act, how and what we eat defines who we are. Food is an essential part of our everyday lives, so normal that we rarely consider how radically the production and consumption of food have changed over time to shape not only human culture, but also our environment as well. Today we sample a little food history with a roundtable of historians, Chris Otter, Helen Veit, and Sam White, who reveal that what we shove into our mouths has shaped our cultures, our bodies, and our planet. So stay tuned. I am Helen Zoe Veit. I'm an associate professor of history at Michigan State University. Hi, I'm Sam White, and I teach global environmental history here at OSU. Hi, I'm Chris Otter, and I teach at OSU, and and among the many things I teach, I teach uh, world food history. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for joining us. Just just to start off, uh, we wanted to ask, you know, in general, why is food an important subject for historians? What are some of the big questions that that food history can tell us that other sorts of history can't? Um, Maybe, Helen, we can start with you. Sure. Um, Food is so incredibly fundamental uh, to everything, and I think it's only you know, a, a very recent modern person who might say, well, you know, it, it's kind of a trivial subject. O- you'd only think that if, if food was, had always been really abundant for you and you would never had to think about it much. But food and how we get food and how we eat it um, has always been just so fundamental, you know, especially if you're looking in, um, you know, a pretty long period of time. So looking at it, um, you know, in the most basic level is really, really just kind of essential for survival. But there are also all sorts of really fascinating cultural aspects that go into what we think is good for us, um, how we eat, who prepares it, um, what we value about food. Um, Of course, there are all sorts of um, potentially religious taboos or um, symbolic meaning that we put into food. So it's really just this incredibly rich subject, both in a very material way and in, you know, this very abstract and cultural way, too. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, Sam or or Chris, do do you want to jump in here? I love food as a historical subject because it's one of those great topics that's both everywhere and nowhere. It's everywhere in the sense that everybody can relate to it. Everybody deals with food every day. And the way they deal with food has a great impact on their own lives and on the environment. But it's also nowhere in the sense that because it's so everyday, because it's so common, historians of the past tend to overlook it in favor of more dramatic and singular events. No, I, I, I'd certainly agree with that. I mean, I think if you take a, a long durée view of history and go right back to the, the Neolithic Revolution when humans actually settled down and started farming, you will find that the origins of pretty much everything historians talk about um, boil down to food and food supply. Um, human health, we start to get the, the eruption of major endemic and epidemic diseases when people start living in, in larger settlements. Um, social stratification, when you get a, a surplus of food, which means that you can have priests and kings and warriors. Um, domestication of, of animals, which is probably far more fateful for animals than it is for us. But ultimately, when you've got a bunch of animals and you can feed them, you can start riding them into combat. So you start getting wars. Um, so health, war, social stratification, urbanization, the state itself, all of these things, can, you can argue, have origins in, in farming uh, and human settlement to farm. Yeah, this is really great. So we're talking about this subject that's really the basis for all of history on some level, right? That's everywhere and nowhere. And so given what historians like you and others have revealed about the history of food nutrition, what would you say is unusual or unprecedented about the way we eat today? Um, And maybe Sam, if you want to start us off here. So it depends a bit what you mean by today. In the very big sweep of human history, what's really interesting is that we're eating mostly domesticated plants and animals rather than wild plants and hunted animals. Uh, If by today you mean in the last couple hundred years, I guess the remarkable thing is that we're eating foods that are coming from long distances and are often highly processed. And their origins and the way they've been processed are often invisible to us. Helen, Um, if if it's something to add? Absolutely. I I would add to that that uh, another really modern innovation is how little cooking is necessary for us. Um, that so much food is avail- available, you know, prepackaged, already cooked, in a completely edible form right away. And that's that's really changed uh, people's relationship with food in terms of time. 
because not only are so few people um, farmers anymore as a percentage of the population, even people who are, you know, cooking food or preparing food are doing so much less preparation and spending so much less of their time doing it. And, of course, that's been a great influence on, you know, women's entry into the workforce, um, people's ability in general not to spend all that much time in the kitchen. And there have been related um, health effects, too, because a lot of this highly processed prepared food is not that great for us. What have been some of the principal moments of change in American diets? And I think, Helen, you are already kind of uh, hinting at a few of these. I mean, I think that, you know, the number one change has been the industrialization of the food supply. And you can't really talk about that without talking about related changes in transportation and also in marketing um, and in things like technology. It's the fact that we have home refrigerators and home freezers um, and these other factory technologies that keep the food good for long periods of time. But this application of science, um, that so much of our food now contains things that, you know, the average person doesn't even know what they are, um, that's, that's extremely new. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, thinking about American foods, we also need to factor in the Colombian exchange itself. Um, we, you know, when you think about a Thanksgiving meal, you are actually eating things which are actually indigenous to America, which is probably the only meal people uh, eat during the course of the year where there's even the slightest possibility of that being the case. Um, following the, the Colombian exchange, we, we have the, the transplantation of, of things like wheat and sugar and, and cattle and pigs into, into the Americas, which transformed the American diet tremendously. And, and kind of roughly when are we talking about here with the Colombian we're, exchange? We're talking sort of the very late 15th and, and 16th, 16th centuries. Why don't we pick up on something that a couple of you have mentioned, um, uh, the ways that these changes in, in diet and in food production have affected the human body, our, our health. What are some of the big, uh, the big ways in which food, changes in food production have affected health in, in the past, uh, say, 200 years? Uh, Chris, maybe we could start with you. Right. I mean, if I could take it back again to the to the, um, sure, to sure. the Neolithic, um, it is it is worth noting that when people settle down, we uh, if you measure skeletons over this period, you see a dramatic drop in in human heights. When people started to farm, they got really quite dramatically shorter. We've only just kind of recovered and exceeded the heights that we we believe that the sort of quote unquote hunter gatherer populations had actually actually achieved. In terms of of relatively recent transformations. I'd say it, you have to. It's very, very ambivalent in many ways. The increased quantities of food that we that we possess, that we consume, the increased amounts of protein and fat relative to carbohydrates have had a, a beneficial effect in many ways. We are bigger, we are stronger, we are able to to do more work, we are able to produce more energy, um, and we're also more resistant to certain forms of infectious disease such as tuberculosis. And I think over the past hundred years in the West, maternal health and fetal health has has genuinely improved as a result of the, the feeding of of mothers. That said. This has to be juxtaposed with a, a whole range of what might be called lifestyle or civiliz- civilizational or mismatched diseases, which are associated with our processed diet from, from heart disease, type 2 diabetes and obesity, down to a rather more niggling and irritating things like diverticulitis, constipation, tooth decay, and so forth. So uh, I think that it's a very, very ambivalent thing. We, we live with a lot of um, food-based morbidity, in our, in our lives, but maybe food has, has transformed our mortality in, in a good way at the same time. When and where do we start seeing uh, food allergies appear? Go ahead. 20, 20th century, mm-hmm. I mean, certainly the, f- the first text discussing food allergy, indeed the first text discussing allergy full stop, and the first food allergy tests date from, I think, around the 1930s, the scratch tests. And the these texts all discuss a single issue that, we, that, that Sam mentioned before, which is processing, which is when you start having mass-produced things like sauces and gravies that have trace elements of egg or flour in, suddenly allergies start popping up all over the place when people are eating things they don't really realize that they're eating. It's, so it's, it's sort of egg, um, uh, egg allergies, milk allergies, the, these sorts of things, wheat allergies start to become people start to become conscious of them. It's probable that people did suffer from these things before, but certainly in terms of its discussion and its measurement, this is very much a 20th century phenomenon. And the explosion of allergies, especially for children, which is what we tend to hear most about when we think about food allergies, um, that explosion is really a late 20th century phenomenon. Really, um, since the early 1980s, there's been um, this dramatic increase that uh, people are really still figuring out the origins of it because it's 
um, it really has been so dramatic. So I went to the grocery store the other day, and it's the middle of winter here in Columbus, and I was able to buy avocados from Mexico, right, apples from Chile. And so today, right, we can easily and often cheaply purchase fresh produce from around the world and world in great variety in almost any season, right? But how recent is this phenomenon, I've kind of been wondering, and how has the globalization of food changed relationships between the United States and the rest of the world? Um, and Helen, if maybe you wanted to start us off here. Sure. So as you note, this um, availability of fresh produce from all over the world is quite new. Um, and there's you know, been a lot of focus on that with the locavore movement, people trying to uh, point out the, especially the environmental downsides of um, the transportation involved. But, uh, you know, as I've um, liked to tell my students, a lot of the locavore movement is is fairly romantic and fairly nostalgic. Although, you know, you could not get avocados in December in Ohio 100 years ago, um, actually 150 years ago, 100 years ago, you, it might have been possible. But one of the big changes is that there was so much food available globally that wasn't fresh, things like chocolate or coffee or sugar or cinnamon or tapioca or salt, um, you know, all sorts of things that people in the 19th and 18th centuries at least were eating were definitely global as well. You know, they weren't fresh. It wasn't fast. But that, that has been a big change, the, the freshness of it. it. It's one part of, a, you know, a broader you know, globalization of, of the marketplace in general. Food is, is one thing that's available globally, but there are, of course, as anyone knows who checks labels on clothing or electronics or anything else, many, many other things available that have come from all over the place. All right. We could really say that there have been two globalizations, one that might date back hundreds or thousands of years, the globalization of uh, relatively imperishable and precious food stuffs such as spices uh, versus the modern globalization of, of fresh food uh, and of food on a large scale, commoditized food, um, which has only really occurred since the mid-19th century when you get first uh, industrial power applied to transportation technology, so railroads and steamships, and then refrigeration, which only followed a couple decades later, really, by the 1870s and 1880s. Yeah, there is a, a brief uh, intervening period when live animals are, are – I mean, live animals are obviously transported all over the world today in, in horrible conditions, but uh, before refrigeration, but when um, steamships uh, and, and um, sort of long-distance shipping was, was feasible, you find, you find animals being shipped across the Atlantic. From Argentina to the, to the UK, live animals were, were shipped in, in often conditions that make slave ships seem relatively appealing. Are there other major events or processes, you know, we asked about specifically about, you know, U.S. and the world. Are there other kind of processes that we haven't asked about here that where food, this thing that's everywhere and nowhere, that you'd highlight how food has played a key role in in kind of global history? Some um, nutritionists and historians of nutrition write about something called the nutrition transition, um, which is which refers to a, a shift in, in which is first seen in Western Europe, in France, in the Netherlands, in 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 Britain, to a diet that is richer in animal proteins, certainly a higher consumption of uh, of meat, higher consumption of dairy, a higher consumption of wheat relative to other grains, and a higher consumption of sugar. This is something you see developing from the 18th century, and in the case of certainly the British case. It it's involve, in, involves something um, we might call the great outsourcing, where, where the British decided to, you know, under the influence of free trade policies from around 1850 onwards, allow their domestic agriculture to effectively go into decline because they could get food more cheaply um, from other parts of the world. Uh, and certainly they could use their, their labor and their land better for industrialization. And this is very closely linked to the development of, of several parts of the world, Australasia, um, to a lesser extent, South Africa, Argentina, certainly, even Denmark and Canada. And all the, these places became heavily involved in the British economy, so much so that uh, in the 1930s, when the global economy crashes and European countries throw out protection, places like Argentina go into spiraling and steepling depression as a consequence. Mm. So they're kind of really – food is a crucial role here in, in these interlinked economies, without, right? Without question, without question. That's right. And in periods, um, for example, during world wars or in you know, the Great Depression or in other times of economic stress, though, that linkages, those linkages become points of vulnerability. Um, and so if you have an import economy, for example, and suddenly you're blockaded during war, um, that becomes a tremendous liability for you in, in an emergency situation. 
And my research focuses mainly on reconstructing past climate and understanding its impact with the hope that it might help us uh, prepare for contemporary climate change. So I put a lot of emphasis in my course on trying to understand uh, past invulnerabilities and famines. Uh, uh, hopefully, it will not be directly relevant to our coming experience of global warming, uh, but I think it, it helps highlight at least the times when food is, is scarce and what our uh, vulnerabilities are in terms of food production and food supply, especially in a changing environment. And what would be some of the ways that um, we could mitigate the risks uh, associated with food production in, in a changing climate? But what comes out of this research, would you say? That's a good question, because I think there are no hard and fast rules. Uh, there are trade-offs, really, to each type of policy that we could have. Um, if we focus more, for instance, on ensuring a global food supply, then we reduce the risk that uh, total food availability uh, will disappear. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we need more people at the mercy of the market and market prices, which can also be very difficult uh, for the poor. Uh, and I think there are other examples where we could see possible trade-offs in, in policy. So I, I guess I wouldn't say in the space for a short interview that there's one clear take-home message from that kind of research. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess in general, and this is a question to everyone, um, uh, based on what you know about the past, about food history, what are some things that, that people could do um, you know, to, uh, to mitigate uh, the environmental impact of the way that we eat or uh, to make positive changes in, in this respect? I, I mean, I think one of the, the things that everyone is going to be thinking more about in the coming decades is trying to produce food in ways that are more efficient for land use and for energy use. And one of the biggest things that individuals can do is to eat less meat, um, which is meat is animal production. It tends to be, you know, is almost always very, very intensive, both in terms of land use and in terms of energy use. So I think that's going to be a major trend. You're already hearing more about it in very mainstream media outlets. Chris, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, to I mean, I think that's that's certainly probably something that we'll all agree on on here. I, I mean, um, I I don't think um, if if the 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 developing world develops um, dietary proclivities that are the same as the United States, um, then we're in astonishingly deep trouble. So, okay. Yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, <laughs> meat production and consumption has really been the, the, the uh, you know, the elephant in the room when it comes to uh, discussions of food availability uh, and food supply. Uh, there is a lot of editorializing, a lot of research going into how will we feed the world. But really, what that research means is how will we feed the world more meat, which is what's right. being increasingly demanded. And often it's it's how we'll feed the world more beef, which is particularly a particularly inefficient type of meat. Um, although the the fastest growing sectors, I, I guess, of the of the meat economy are, are poultry and and pork, which are arguably the most um, the most barbaric. Really, the most barbaric. Can you? Expand on that a bit. Yeah, I mean, if you if 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 one was to um, enter a, um, a a poultry complex, um, one would see poultry living in in astonishingly small um, spaces. Um, uh, the average chicken lives what forty two days, I think, is, is it now. It's uh, uh, it was sixty days in in, in the fifties, and and similarly, pork production has retreated into uh, these kinds of, of, of factory environments. So factory farming is, is something you see far more, um, it's far more widespread with chicken and with pork than it is with, with beef. Uh, cattle do get some chance to at least roam about outside. Yes, it's an unfortunate trade-off insofar as the least environmentally unfriendly, I guess I could say, types of uh, meat production tend also to be the most concentrated and create the most uh, welfare issues that relate uh, mm -hmm. to that kind of confinement and uh, but, you know, large concentrations of animals. So eating insects is probably the best uh, option. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Eat, eating sardines. Sardines, okay. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, it doesn't seem super likely that everyone's going to start eating insects, but um, <laughs> w what changes do you think are likely, say, you know, in the next uh, 20, 50 years in diets, American diets or, or around the world? I think it will depend in part on whether market... Uh, prices are allowed to take into account total costs. Uh, there, there is a market solution, obviously, to the resource demands of, of beef in particular, which would be to reflect them in the price of beef uh, that consumers pay. And if that were to happen, then we'll see the market rationing beef uh, by price uh, more and more. 
what I think is, we'll find, though, is that might be very difficult because food is about more than just an issue of taste. It's going to be about an issue of identity, of politics, of uh, feelings of, of class and, and identity. Uh, and that makes it very hard, I think, to let those market forces uh, take their way uh, and, and help, hopefully, uh, you know, ration resources accordingly. I think that, um, you know, as I said earlier, meat consumption will probably go down, whether it's because it has to, because it's actually not sustainable and it, it just becomes less feasible, or whether there are market solutions. Um, I think not just meat, but also dairy, um, cheese, products like that are going to have to go down in some way. Um, it, it will be interesting to see what happens with the fisheries. Um, a lot of fish populations are on the verge of collapse um, because of unsustainable fishing method, methods. So, um, you know, we might see a world in the future with very little fish. And, you know, I, I also think that some of these things we talked about, like eating insects, um, that, you know, I could see that getting popular because of um, necessity, but also potentially just because older taboos are breaking down. We're already seeing culturally a lot of the taboos that really defined American culture in the 20th century um, really disappearing, spearheaded by um, sort of adventurous foodies, but um, a lot of things that seemed adventurous and taboo 20 years ago, like sushi in this country, um, have become so mainstream that um, I, I think there are going to be a lot more examples of things like that, things that seemed um, you know, inedible in previous generations that become newly edible again. Um, I, I'd like to think that's the case. I think food taboos, um, I, I think they're, they're harder to break than, than we might think. If you think about the, the, the um, example of, say, horse meat, I mean, again, the, the horse meat taboo was broken in, in France and in Germany and in Belgium and in Italy in the, in the 19th century. Um, it wasn't broken in, in the Anglophone world, partly because it was broken in, in other parts of Europe and it was associated with being sort of uncivilized to consume uh, horse. That said, horse meat is still not widely consumed in, in Europe. It's uh, Maybe Italy probably has the highest consumption of, of horse meat. Maybe Mexico and Brazil have a higher level. So I'd like to think that's the case. But I, I worry that, that we're going to keep going like this um, for the foreseeable future. So we'll have to wrap it up there, though. Uh, we want to thank our three guests, Helen Veit, who joined us from Michigan State by phone, and Chris Otter and Sam White, both from Ohio State, for being here on History Talk. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank, you. thank you. This edition of the Origins Podcast History Talk was brought to you by the Public History Initiative and the Goldberg Center in the History Department at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, and Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Our main editors are Stephen Kahn and Nicholas Breifogel. Our executive producer is David Staley. Our audio and technical advisor is Paul Koteheimer. Our audio producers and hosts are Patrick Payandi and Mark Sikolsky. Song and band information can be found on our website. You can find our podcasts and more at origins.osu.edu, on iTunes, and on SoundCloud. And as always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. Thank you for listening. <laughs>